Chapter 95, Father and Daughter. We have seen in the preceding chapter Madame Dangler's coming formally to announce to Madame de Villefort the approaching marriage of Eugenie Dangler and Andrea Cavalcanti. This formal announcement, which implied, or appeared to imply, a resolution taken by all the parties concerned in this great affair, had been preceded by a scene to which our readers must be admitted. We beg them to take one step backwards and to transport themselves the morning of that day of great catastrophes into the beautiful gilded salon we have before shown them, and which was the pride of its owner, the Baron Dangers. In this room, at about ten o'clock in the morning, the banker himself had been walking some minutes, thoughtful and evidently uneasy, watching each door and listening to every sound. When his patience was exhausted, he called his valet. Stephen, said he, see why Mademoiselle Eugenie has asked me to meet her in the drawing room, and why she makes me wait so long. Having given this vent to his ill humor, the baron became more calm. Mademoiselle Danglars had that morning requested an interview with her father, and had fixed on that drawing room as the spot. The singularity of this step, and above all, its former character, had not a little surprised the banker who had immediately obeyed his daughter by repairing first to the drawing room. Stephen soon returned from his errand. Mademoiselle lady's maid says, sir, that mademoiselle is finishing her toilet and will be here shortly. Danglars nodded to signify he was satisfied. To the world and to his servants, Danglars assumed the good-natured man and the weak father. This was one of his characters in the popular comedy he was performing. It was a physiognomy that he had adopted, and which appeared as suitable to him as it was to the right side of the profile masks of the fathers of the ancient theatres to have a turned up and laughing lip, while on the other side it was drawn down and sulky. Let us hasten to say that, in private, the turned up and laughing lip descended to the level of the drawn down an ill-tempered one, so that, generally, the indulgent man disappeared to give place to the brutal husband and domineering father. Why the devil does the foolish girl, who pretends to wish to speak to me, not come into my cabinet? And why, above all, can she want to speak to me at all? He was revolving this worrying thought in his brain for the twentieth time, when the when the door opened and Eugenie appeared, attired in a figured black satin dress, her hair arranged and gloves on, as if going to the Italian opera. Well, Eugenie, what is it you want with me, and why in the solemn drawing room when the cabinet is so comfortable? You're right, sir, replied Eugenie, making a sign to her father that he could sit down, and have proposed two questions which include all the conversation we are going to have. I will answer them both, and contrary to the usual method, the last first, as being the last least complex. I have chosen a drawing room, sir, as our place of rendezvous, in order to avoid the disagreeable impression and influence of a banker's office. Those cash books, gilded as they may be, those drawers, locked like gates of fortresses, those heaps of bank bills, come from I know not where at the quantities of letters from England, Holland, Spain, India, China, and Peru have generally a strange influence on a father's mind and make him forget there is, a, in, there is in the world an interest greater and more sacred than the good opinion of his correspondence. I have therefore chosen this drawing room where you see, smiling and happy in their magnificent frames, your portrait, mine, my mother's, and all sorts of rural landscapes and touching pastorals. I rely much on external impressions. Perhaps, with regard to you, they are immaterial, but I should be no artist if I had not some fancies." Very well, replied Danglars, who had listened to all this permeable with imperturbable coolness, but without understanding a word, engaged as he was, like every man burdened with hidden thoughts, in seeking the thread of his own ideas in those of the speaker. There is, then, the second point cleared up, or nearly so, said the genie, without the least confusion, and with that masculine pointedness 
which distinguished her gesture and her language, and you appear satisfied with the explanation. Now, let's return to the first. You asked me why I have requested in this interview. I will tell you in two words, sir. I will not marry Monsieur le Comte Andrea Cavalcanti. Danglars bounded from his chair, and with this motion raised his eyes and arms toward heaven. Yes, indeed, sir, continued Eugenie, still quite calm. You are astonished, I see, for since this little affair commenced, I have not manifested the slightest opposition. Sure, as I always am, when the opportunity arrives, to oppose to people who have not consulted me, and things which displease me, a determined and absolute will. However, this time, this tranquillity, this passiveness, and philosophers say, proceeded from another source. It proceeded from a wish, like a submissive and devoted daughter. A light smile was observed on the purple lips of the young girl. To try and practice obedience. Well, asked the danglers. Well, sir, replied Eugenie, I have tried to the very last, and now the moment has come. In spite of all my efforts, I feel it is impossible. But, said danglers, whose weak mind was at first quite overwhelmed with the weight of this pitiless logic, marking evident premeditation and force of, of forces of will. What is your reason for this refusal, Eugenie? What reason do you assign? My reason? replied the young girl. Well, it is not that the man is more ugly, more foolish, or more disagreeable than any other. No, Monsieur Cavalcanti may appear to those who look at men's faces and figures a very good model. It is not, either, that my heart is less touched by him than any other. That would be a schoolgirl's reason which I consider quite beneath me. I actually love no one, sir. You know it, do you not? I do not, then, see why, without real necessity, I should encumber my life with a perpetual companion. Has not some sage said, nothing to excesses, and another, carry everything with you? I have been taught those two aphorisms in Latin and in Greek. One is, I believe, from and the other from bias. Well, my dear father, in the shipwreck of life, for life is an internal shipwreck of our hopes, I cast into the sea my useless baggage. That is all, and I remain with my own will, disposed to live perfectly alone and consequently perfectly free. Unhappy girl, unhappy girl, murmured Danglars, turning pale, for he knew from long experience the solidity of the obstacles he so suddenly encounters. Unhappy girl, replied Eugenie. Unhappy girl, do you say, sir? No, indeed. The ex exclamation appears quite theatrical and affected. Happy, on the contrary. For what am I in want of? The world calls me beautiful. It is something to be well received. I like a, I like a favorable reception. It expands the countenance, and those around me do not then appear so ugly. I possess a share of wit and a certain relative sensibility which enables me to draw from internal general life. From the support of mine, all I meet with that is good, like the monkey who cracks the nut to get its contents. I'm rich, for you have one of the first fortunes in France. I'm your only daughter, and you are not so tenacious as the fathers of La Porte saint Marin and La Gator, who disinherit their daughters because they will give them no grandchildren. Besides, the law in its foresight has deprived you of the power to disinherit me, at least entirely, as it has also the power to compel me to marry a particular person. Thus, beautiful, witty, and somewhat talented, as the comic opera say, and rich. Why, that is happiness, sir. Why do you call me unhappy? Danglars, seeing his daughter smiling and proud even to insolence, could not entirely repress his brutal feelings but they betrayed themselves only by an exclamation. Under the inquiring gaze of his daughter, before that beautiful black eyebrow, contracted by interrogation, his prudence turned away, and calmed himself immediately, daunted by the iron hand of circumspection. Truly, my daughter, replied he with a smile, you are all you, you, are all you boast of being, except in one thing, I will not too hastily tell you which, but you would rather leave you to guess it. Eugenie looked at Danglars, much surprised that one flower of her crown of pride, with which she had so superbly decked herself, 
should be disputed. My daughter, continued the banker, you have perfectly exclaimed, explained to me the sentiments which influence a girl like you who is determined she will not marry. Now it will remain for me to tell you the motives of a father like me, who has decided his daughter shall marry. Eugenie bowed, not as a submissive daughter, but as an adversary prepared for a discussion. My daughter, continued Danglars, when a father asks his daughter to choose a husband, he has always some reason for wishing her to marry. Some are affected with the mania to which you alluded just now, that of living again in their grandchildren. This is not my weakness. I tell you at once, family joys have no charm for me. I may acknowledge this to a daughter whom I know to be philosophical enough to understand my indifference, and not to impute it to me as a crime. A la bonheur, said Eugenie. Let's speak candidly, sir. I admire it. Oh, said Danglars, I can, when circumstances render it, it desirable, adopt your love of frankness, although it may not be my general practice. I will therefore proceed. I have proposed to you to marry, not for your sake, for indeed, I did not think of you in the least at the moment. You admire candor, and will now be satisfied, I hope. But because I had need of your taking this husband as soon as possible, on account of certain commercial speculations I am desirous of entering into, Eugenie became uneasy. It is just so, I assure you, and you must not be angry with me, for you have sought this disclosure. I do not willingly enter into all these arithmetical explanations with an artist like you, who fear to enter my office, lest you should imbibe disagreeable or anti-poetic impressions and sensations. But in that same banker's office, where you very willingly presented yourself yesterday to ask for the thousand francs I give you monthly for pocket money, you must know, my dear young lady, many things may be learned, useful even to a girl who will not marry. There are there there are one may learn, for instance, what, out of regard to your nervous suspects of suspectability, I will inform you of in the drawing room, namely, that the credit of a banker in is his physical and normal life. That credit sustains him as a breath animates the body, and Monsieur de Monte Cristo once gave me a lecture on the subject, which I have never forgotten. There we may learn that as credit sinks, the body becomes a corpse, and this is what must happen very soon to the banker who is proud to own so good a logician as you for his daughter. But Eugenie, instead of stooping, drew herself up under the blow. Ruined, said she. Exactly, my daughter, that is precisely what I mean, said Danglars, almost digging his nails into his breast, while he preserved on his ha harsh features the smile of a heartless, though clever man. Ruined, yes, that it is. Yes, said Eugenie. Ruined, now it is revealed, the secret so full of horror as the tragic poet says now my daughter learn from my lips how you may alleviate this misfortune as far as it will affect you oh cried eugenie you are a bad physiognomist if you imagine i deplore on my own account that the catastrophe you announced to me i ruined and what will that signify to me have i not my talent left can i not like pasta malabrum greasy Acquire for myself what you would never have given me, whatever might have been your fortune. A hundred were a hundred and fifty thousand livers are uh, livers per annum, for which I shall be indebted to no one but myself, and which, instead of being given, as you gave me those poor twelve thousand francs, with pouting looks and reproaches for my prodigality, will be accompanied with acclamations, with bravos, and with flowers. And if I do not possess the talent, which your smiles prove to me you doubt, should I not still have that furious love of independence, which will be a substitute for all treasure, and which, in my mind, supersedes even the instinct of self-preservation? No, I, greet, I grieve not on my own account. I shall always find a resource. My books, my pencils, my piano, all those things which cost but little, and which I shall be able to procure will remain my own. Do you think I can so that I sorrow for my damned danglers? Undeceive yourself again. Either I am greatly mis mis mistaken, or she has provided against the catastrophe which threatens you, 
and the witch will pass over without affecting her. She has taken care for herself, at least I hope so, for her attention has not been diverted from her projects by watching over me. She has left me my entire independence by professedly indulging my love for liberty. Oh no, sir, from my childhood I have seen so much and understood too much of what has passed around me, for misfortune to have an undue power over me. From my earliest recollections, I have been beloved by no one, so much the worse. That has naturally led me to love no one, so much the better. Now you have my profession of faith. Then, said Danglars, pale with anger, which did not emanate from offended paternal love. Then, mademoiselle, you persist in your determination to accelerate my ruin. Your ruin? I I accelerate your ruin? What do you mean? I don't understand you. So much the better. I have a ray of hope left. Listen. I am all attention, said Eugenie, looking so earnestly at, at, at her father, that it was an effort to the latter to bear her powerful gaze. Monsieur Cavalcanti, continued Danglars, is about to marry you, and will place in my hands his fortune, accounting you three million livres. That is admirable, said Eugenie, with sovereign contempt, soothing her gloves out one upon the other. You think I shall deprive you of these three million, said Danglars, but do not fear it. They are destined to produce at least ten. I and the brother banker have obtained a grant of a railway, the only speculation which in the present day offers any prospect of immediate success, like the Chimerical Mississippi. The law formerly supplied for the good Parisians, those eternal goals in speculation. In my reckoning, a man now ought to have a million of a railway, as we used to have an acre of unimproved land upon the banks of Ohio. It is hypothecation, which is an advance, as you see, since we gain at least ten, fifteen, twenty, or a thousand pounds of iron exchange for our money. Well, within a week I am to deposit four millions for my share. These four millions, I promise you, will produce ten or twelve. But during my visit to you the day before yesterday, sir, which you appear to recollect so well, replied Eugenie. I saw you enter in your accounts. Is not that the term? Five millions and a half. You, you even pointed them out to me in two drafts on the treasury, and you were astonished that so valuable a paper did not dazzle my eyes like lightning. Yes, but those five millions and a half are not mine, and are only a proof of the great confidence placed in me. My title of popular banker has gained me the confidence of hospitals, and the five millions and a half belong to the hospitals. At any other time, I should not have hesitated to make use of them, but the great losses I have recently sustained are well known. And, as I told you, my credit is rather shaken, that the deposit may be at any moment withdrawn. And if I had employed it for another purpose, I should bring on me a disgraceful bankruptcy. I do not despise bankruptcies. I believe me, but they must be those which enrich, and not those who which ruin. Now, if you marry Monsieur Cavalcanti, and I touch the three millions, or even if it is thought I am going to touch them, my credit will be restored, and my fortune, which for the last month or two has been swallowed up in gulfs, which, ha- which have been opened in my path by an inconceivable fatality, will revive. Do you understand me? Perfectly. You pledge me for three millions, do you not? The greater the amount, the more flattering it is to you. It gives you an idea of your value. Thank you. One word more, sir. Do you promise me to make that what use you can of the report of the fortune of Monsieur Cavalcanti will bring without touching the sum? It is no act of selfishness, but of honesty. I am willing to help rebuild your fortune, but I will not be an accomplice in the ruin of the others. But since I tell you, cried Danglars, that with these three millions, did you expect to recover your position, sir, without touching those three millions? I hope so, if the marriage should take place and confirm my credit. Shall you be able to pay Monsieur Cavalcanti the five hundred thousand francs you promised for my dowry? He shall receive them on returning from the town hall. Well, what next? What more do you want? I wish to know if... 
and demanding my signature, you leave me entirely free in my person. Absolutely. Then, well, as I said before, I am ready to marry Monsieur Cavalcanti. But what are your projects? Ah, that is my secret. What advantage should I have over you, knowing、uh, your secret? I were to tell you mine. Dangler spit his lips. Then said he, "You are ready to pay the formal visits, which are absolutely indispensable." Yes, replied the genie, and to sign the contract in three days. Yes, then in my turn I will say, "Well." Dangler pressed his daughter's hand in his. But it was extraordinary. Neither did the father say "thank you, my child," nor did the daughter smile at her father. Is the conference ended? Asked Eugenie, rising. Tinkler's motioned that he had nothing more to say. Five minutes afterward, the piano resounded at the touch of Mademoiselle de Vrigny's fingers, and Mademoiselle Tinkler was singing Brabantio's malediction on Desdemona. At the end of the piece, Stephen entered and announced to Eugenie that the horses were to the carriage, and the Baroness was waiting for her to pay her visits. We have seen them at the Villeforts. They proceed them on their course.